everyone and welcome to this information session for the Ukraine Civil Society Facility. On behalf of the EU delegation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this thematic information uh, session. My name is Sinziana Poyana, I work for the EU delegation to Ukraine and I cover civil society support there. The reason you're here is because you are interested in one of the lots um, that make available funding for civil society organizations within our recently launched call on the 16th of June. In this session you will hear more of why we chose this specific thematic priority, what do we expect from civil society to deliver, why do we focus on certain types of actions, why do we chose certain type of organizations to be eligible to apply and access this funding. So for the next 45 minutes or so, you will hear presentations from colleagues from the EU delegation to Ukraine who will speak to you about the specific sector you are interested in, but also we will take some of your questions that you submitted through your registration form and try to answer them as good as possible and as interesting for you as possible. A small reminder, even though you submitted questions through the registration form, do not forget to also send them to our email address and ask for official clarifications if you need them so or if you have further inquiries that you would like to make. You have this possibility open until July 24. Before we move to the presentation of the specific thematic area, I would just like to recall a few elements of the call. For those of you who are not able to attend the general information session on June 22nd, please take a moment and have a look at it on EU Prostir website. You will be able to retrieve the recording for that session and hopefully have you know, your own presentation of what the general call is about. If it is easier for you to do it that way, then by reading the guidelines. I wish you all the best of luck with the application for this call and I do hope that this information session will be very useful for the design of your concept note and that you will finally decide to apply for this call and be successful to the next stage. Until then, deadline 14th of August, remember, stay well and safe. Dear colleagues, I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to this uh, first presentation of, uh, of, of the first uh, lot, which is, which is dedicated to the sustainable development. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, present myself. Um, my name is Olga Borodankova and I'm a responsible um, sector management manager for, for the energy efficiency issues at the EU delegation uh, to Ukraine. That is uh, my main focus. But today we will speak about uh, sustainable development at large, which, uh, which actually goes wider than uh, only uh, energy efficiency issues. So uh, let me share uh, the presentation with you. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's a bit unusual format, so um, you can see me probably and you can hear me, but uh, I don't really see you and I cannot uh, see your reaction, but uh, Let's try and I will do my best to make it uh, to make it as interesting as possible. So, uh, first of all, what is uh, sustainable development? Actually, if we speak about sustainability, sustainable uh, development as a, an umbrella concept, it's uh, quite large and includes uh, many different components. And sustainability is a development that actually satisfies uh, our needs today without uh, compromising the uh, the needs of, of the upcoming uh, generations and uh, actually guarantees a balance between uh, economic growth, uh, which is very much required, and care for the planet, for the environment, and uh, social well being of, uh, of the people inhabiting the planet. Uh, there are so called sustainable development goals. Uh, which have been uh, established by the United Nations. It was a call to all the countries that belong to the United uh, Nations uh, to address uh, the great challenges that humanity faces and to ensure that all people have the same opportunities uh, for a better life uh, without compromising uh, our planet. In total, there are 17 goals, as you can see, and several of them are related to the environment and uh, climate change. 
for instance, number, number seven, affordable and clean energy, uh, sustainable cities and communities, number 11, uh, number 13, uh, climate action. Uh, so we'll focus mostly on, on them today. Uh, actually, this talk today is very timely. Uh, yesterday, the EU gave the start to the EU Sustainable Energy Week, and I hope that you have seen the video addressed by the EU ambassador to Ukraine, Mati Masikas. If not, please have a look uh, after this session. It's published on uh, Facebook. Uh, the EU Sustainable Energy Week is an event, um, pan-European event, around the topic of sustainable development, environmental problems, use of resources, and uh, climate change. It brings together the government, private sector, civil society, and consumers uh, uh, to, provide, to promote uh, in initiatives around the sustainable development. In Ukraine, uh, the EU Sustainable Energy Week is celebrated annually, and uh, this year it's the 11th edition, and Ukraine shows its high commitment to the topic, and the EU is there to help the country in its goals and aspirations. Um, so, We'll, we'll talk about this, uh, these topics uh, today, which are actually also under the EU Sustainable Energy Week. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, the climate map of Ukraine has changed. And uh, climate change is affecting Ukraine maybe even more than uh, some other countries. And you know, um, this climate map, uh, climate change map, which is being taught in schools, is already outdated. You know, um, southern part of Ukraine might turn into desert by the end of, uh, of the century. And uh, uh, let's say the change is imminent and it's, it might really represent a danger for the future generation. So you are witnessing actually yourself that so there is a substantial increase of uh, the average temperature in Ukraine. It's 1.1. Uh, degrees Celsius, and actually it's higher than uh, than the worldwide. Uh, the temperature changes actually already since the end of uh, 80s, and between uh, the end of 80s and the end of the 20th century, it has increased by more than uh, three degrees uh, Celsius. You have also also seen all these anomalies, like abnormally warm winter uh, one year ago and uh, two years ago. Uh, snowing in May, uh, you see that summer uh, become really drier and hotter. Actually, in the last five uh, years, they have taken almost 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And also, the structure of atmospheric precipitation is uh, is radically changing. There is uh, less snow in winter, like this winter. You've seen that there, is, there was actually almost no winter. There is more rain and and slit. And this uh, affects a lot uh, energy transmission lines and also road safety. And uh, this impacts the change of um, subterranean uh, waters. Um, and, uh, and of course, also, for instance, uh, uh, hydropower plants, which, are, which used to be uh, widely used in, in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine as a state fully realizes the danger of the climate change, uh, therefore it has taken action at the international level. So I will present today uh, two instruments uh, to which Ukraine has, uh, has committed and which can um, actually uh, help Ukraine to, uh, to mitigate the climate change. So first of all, the association agreement with the EU that Ukraine signed in uh, 2015. Uh, it includes numerous um, uh, chapters which are related uh, to the climate change, so, such as energy, transport, and uh, environment. So Ukraine is um, is adapting its its legislation to the EU legislation, so and uh, and improving it, upgrading it um, to face all those uh, challenges that we have just mentioned. So also there is a Paris Agreement. I'm sure you have uh, heard about it. It was adopted in December 2015. It's the first uh, universal legally binding uh, global climate change uh, agreement. So the countries have agreed that the global warming will not go beyond uh, two degrees Celsius. And so this agreement invites all parties to prepare and uh, adopt low greenhouse um, gas emission development strategies by 2020. 
And Ukraine actually was one of the first countries that uh, ratified the agreement in 2016 and uh, delivered uh, such a strategy uh, in uh, 2018 already. <clears throat> uh, the EU uh, is taking the climate change uh, very seriously. Over the last years, we had um, um, we had specific targets. Uh, by 2020, we had to um, increase the number of renewables by 20%, uh, shrink the energy use by uh, 20%. And so these goals have been changing uh, every decade. So by now, we have established very concrete goals by uh, 2015. And they, they are part of the new European Green Deal uh, initiative that the European Commission, the new European Commission announced in uh, December uh, last year. The European uh, Green Deal is a holistic policy turning climate and uh, environmental changes into opportunities across all policy areas. Actually, it's about reaching climate neutrality by uh, 2015, meaning that there will be zero e emission by that time. Boosting innovation provides uh, quality food. Uh, the EU Green Deal creates opportunities for more mobility, new businesses, markets, uh, healthier jobs, cleaner cities, higher quality of life. Actually, in other words, uh, the Green Deal is a new EU uh, growth uh, strategy. Um, the EU Green Deal covers nearly all the areas of our economy, all sectors, including energy, transport, waste management, food, but also health. None of these topics uh, I, uh, is new in our cooperation with Ukraine, but we will intensify the focus on those in the upcoming months and years to achieve common goals with regards to greening uh, our economy, economies, respective economies. Um, in the graph on your right, uh, you can see what changes the EU Green Deal will bring, uh, will bring to the citizens. So clean air, reusable or recyclable packaging, less, less waste, uh, more char charging points for electric cars, more affordable energy, renovated homes. And I'm also sure that during this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, some of you have already uh, uh, adopted um, those, I mean, some of those habits, for instance, we consume less, we have less, uh, less um, let's say, um, less packaging, maybe, if, if you are lucky, I also know that in some cases people experience that there were more packages, uh, protective packages during, uh, during this health crisis. So, and that's, uh, that's really important that we also take, take the lessons from this crisis and these better habits, uh, we keep them, we don't forget them in uh, 2020. So, as uh, Ukraine for the moment cannot really replicate this uh, huge uh, initiative in the EU, uh, Ukraine can still do lots of things uh, within its country, but of course with the, with the help of the European Union. So, uh, build its own new holistic uh, sustainable uh, growth uh, strategy, which is inspired by uh, the EU Green Deal, and actually the Ukraine is already uh, doing that. Ukraine announced very quickly that it wants to be part of the Green Deal. Focus on its current obligations set in the international agreements and uh, national strategies, like the one that I've mentioned within the Association Agreement, the Paris Agreement. Increase its uh, ambitions related to climate action and contribute to the goals of climate neutral Europe by uh, 2015. Also, after the crisis of COVID-19, focus on uh, new green ecological practices and uh, avoiding going back to the new uh, to the polluting ones that belong to the past. So yes, I have uh, just mentioned. Let's let's keep those habits that we have already acquired and do not go to square one. So how the EU is helping Ukraine in light of the EU Green Deal? As a specific response in Ukraine uh, to the EU um, Green Deal initiative, the EU has allocated a uh, 10 million program in um, 2020. There will be a program called CASE, Climate Package for Sustainable Economy. 
uh, it will be launched in 2020 and uh, so its amount is uh, 10 million as I have mentioned. So there will be three main directions of work, one related to energy, so climate neutral, uh, clean resource energy with efficient energy use and uh, secure energy supply and consumption. So it's mostly about energy efficiency and renewables. So climate change mitigation, so how uh, we can combat uh, climate change, so the ways to do it, and uh, stimulation of um, uh, circular uh, economy. So how to ensure that manufacturing, consumption and use and recycling is one, uh, one part of the, or several parts of the same process and that uh, they are um, nature friendly. And so all these, uh, all these areas uh, will involve technical assistance. So we mean, this means mostly uh, support to, uh, to policy making and uh, local projects. Uh, energy efficiency is at the center of the EU Green Deal and one of its uh, main areas. However, the cooperation in this area between the EU and Ukraine uh, is not new. The EU has a number of initiatives and provides funding for local and uh, national uh, projects. Um, so we mostly started in uh, financing municipal uh, energy efficiency, such as um, renovation of public buildings and school, uh, kindergartens and universities through such projects as uh, the Covenant of Mayors, I will talk about it a bit later, uh, with the help of the European Investment Bank, also with the EFAFP fund, so Eastern Europe uh, Energy Efficiency and uh, Environmental Partnership Fund. So through this, we also focus on uh, district heating. Um, we aim to modernize it all, um, all around uh, Ukraine. And uh, uh, so after these municipal projects, uh, we also decided to switch to, to the residential energy efficiency. Actually, uh, the residential sector consumes uh, around 40% of all energy in, in Ukraine. And this is very important that uh, the residents also take their responsibility for, for their consumption. Uh, that's why we, uh, the EU together with Germany and the government of Ukraine, uh, we created uh, uh, the energy efficiency fund and uh, we strongly support it, supporting it with uh, um, with the technical assistance with grants through energy efficiency support program for Ukraine. I will talk about it a bit later. So, first of all, about the Covenant of Mayors initiative, uh, which is a pan-European initiative. It's present in uh, uh, fifty-nine participating countries. So. Uh, actually, it goes wider than, than Europe if you count the number of, of the countries involved in Ukraine. There are 270 signatories. But actually, this number may seem quite uh, insignificant because the number of municipalities in Ukraine is huge. What is really important is the number of people who live in the municipalities which are covered by the Covenant of Mayors. So 47%, nearly half of the population of Ukraine live in the cities, municipalities, that have committed to the goals of the Covenant of Mayors. So this is a, a re reduction of CO2 emissions by 30% by 2030. Sorry, there is a mistake in presentation. 30% by 2030. So uh, we have been running 17 projects. These are demonstration projects in municipalities, which, are, which have less than uh, 200,000 inhabitants. So we provided uh, grants to those municipalities, 80% uh, from the EU and 20% was supposed to come uh, from municipalities. So, um, and mostly we focused on public buildings and infrastructure. Uh, you see the pictures uh, of the uh, projects in progress at the time when they were taken. It, this project was still in, in uh, process now, it's uh, finalized and this comes from, from a city of uh, Zmierinka in, uh, uh, in Vinitsa Oblast. So that's about the Covenant of Mayors. Uh, so the Energy Efficiency Support Program for Ukraine. 
Uh, it's one of our biggest uh, programs uh, currently in, uh, in Ukraine. So it's 104 million euros that we contribute uh, to the energy efficiency funds via grants and also uh, the technical assistance. We do not forget, of course, about um, reforms and, uh, and policy dialogue on energy. So the main, the main goal is to demo modernize uh, the residential sector of, uh, of Ukraine um, through the mechanism, which is your Ukrainian Energy Efficiency Fund. So by now it has uh, been running for almost uh, one year with its first program called uh, Energodim. Uh, which was started in September, and the fund by today has received 110 uh, applications for more than uh, half a billion uh, grivnas for projects. So um, that's uh, that was shortly uh, about it. Actually, if you want to hear more about the Covenant of Mayors and uh, um, the Energy Efficiency Fund. Um, you can also follow the program of the EU Sustainable Energy Week on the, on the website of the EU, EU delegation. And you will see a number of events that, are, uh, that, sh that actually will be dedicated to those topics. So that was it about uh, the EU uh, action really, uh, related to climate, environment and energy in uh, Ukraine. And so how can your organization contribute to the areas we have just uh, covered? Uh, first of all, a civil society organizations could contribute to better management in those areas through the involvement of um, citizens, environmental impact assessment and uh, local planning. So maybe just an explanation of what environmental impact assessment is. For instance, if in your city in your region someone is constructing a road a bridge or a new plant it's compulsory to make um, the assessment of how this action how this project will influence uh, the environment and uh, the civil society role um, could be ensuring that uh, this environmental impact assessment is uh, is made uh, openly and uh, and uh, transparently also, the local planning. Um, if your city is planning to, to renovate uh, schools and uh, kindergartens, uh, it's, it's really important to, to take it all this approach uh, holistically because you will not start renovating uh, public buildings, actually, you know, those kindergartens and schools, if the number of students and, uh, is, and kids is, uh, is decreasing in, um, in, your, in your municipality. So you will not renovate, like 10 schools will be half empty, but you will choose five of them and uh, make them really uh, functional and uh, operational and up to the EU standards. So um, civil society organization could also contribute to increased awareness in, in Ukraine and support in uh, the following fields like energy efficiency and uh, renewables. So the energy efficiency fund is already doing that, but support from the civil societies uh, is really always, always needed. Clean, safe and uh, connected uh, mobility urban greening which is uh, which is really badly needed in the uh, in the climate change circumstances also waste management uh, local pollution reduction lots of work is being done with the population but we see that it's actually it's never enough and uh, uh, ukraine is making progress but still lots lots need to be done and here your input would be really very valuable What's also important is that civil society organizations reach out to citizens and uh, stakeholders and inform them about the international commitments of Ukraine, and which were uh, taken within the Paris Agreement, for instance, and uh, of those advantages of uh, sustainable transformation, which is uh, which are actually stipulated in the association agreement uh, with the EU. So this is examples of, of possible contribution. So once again, 
If you're interested in the topic, please follow our events uh, this week. Uh, check the program on the uh, Facebook page of the EU delegation. And um, I would like to thank you for, for your attention. And if there are any uh, questions uh, related to the content of this presentation, I will be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, it was it was quite informative and uh, definitely set us off to uh, to a very good start in understanding uh, where were we coming from uh, with this uh, the, the proposal for funding that uh, we have available under Lot One of the Ukraine uh, Civil Society facility. Um, uh, maybe just to sum up a couple of the points that that you have raised um, as well. So, so, so first, uh, we we saw that Ukraine has a number of sustainability challenges. That in some areas, uh, U Ukraine has already developed a, a strategy and has already acknowledged uh, uh, both the problem and proposed certain solutions. Um, however, this is not uh, nearly enough. Um, I think you you gave us quite a, a comprehensive overview of what the investment that the EU has already made uh, in uh, trying to support Ukraine moving forward towards its uh, uh, sustainability targets, especially those that uh, uh, itself committed to, uh, to, to achieve. Uh, maybe another point that, that I would like to add, coming from the civil society perspective, uh, basically the, the, the funding that is made available, the 3 million euro that you would be competing for under this, this lot, uh, comes from a, a global program dedicated to civil society organizations intended to build the capacities of, uh, of civil society to address these global sustainability challenges. Uh, therefore, you know, together with our sustainability policy, this comes in this wider framework of uh, you, you, the EU driving a global agenda on sustainability, uh, on sustainability issues. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, Olga, the EU Green Deal is uh, probably, you know, the biggest item on, on the agenda of our new political leadership, therefore very important uh, uh, for us. So it, is, it was not a coincidence that this is lot one. <laughs> it is, uh, uh, you know, very important that, that we make funding available for civil society organizations to, to achieve those targets. Um, a second point that I would like to, to add, there is this uh, um, uh, angle in Ukraine that maybe does not come out so strongly in the guidelines, also because we have so many uh, lots and so many priorities that, uh, that we make available funding for. Uh, but um, uh, according to uh, independent oversight here in Ukraine, uh, the uh, environmental uh, climate change sustainability activists, but particularly environment uh, activists, um, uh, they are uh, uh, second uh, to anti-corruption activists uh, in being targeted by various attacks, uh, including physical uh, threats, you know, brought to their lives. So uh, this is something that uh, we very much monitor and something that we also take into account when, uh, you know, uh, proposing this, this funding. Uh, another of um, maybe small elements that I mean this is something that that you see in uh, in the guidelines as well, but just a, a reminder. Um, uh, so basically, you are able to ask a maximum a minimum of four hundred thousand euro uh, EU contribution and a maximum of eight hundred thousand under this lot. So uh, the size of projects is is quite big. Um, uh, organizations, uh, civil society organizations that are registered in Ukraine are those that are eligible uh, to uh, to apply. Uh, however, as co-applicants, you may, and in fact, you are encouraged uh, to partner up with uh, local authorities. And uh, I believe that some of the points that Olga made as well, uh, referring to, you know, the focus of our programs, you know, covenant of mayors stems from this idea that in order to produce sustainable change, uh, you need to get as many relevant stakeholders on board um, uh, and, uh, and uh, drive uh, an agenda that is built on consensus um, uh, and on a general understanding and commitment also of the government uh, at all levels, but particularly uh, local authorities. 
Um, another point um, you will see in in the guidelines that you are required to have a minimum of two uh, of two partners uh, as co applicants. You may have associates and affiliated entities, but not to forget uh, that uh, you need to have uh, partners. Um, at the same time, um, uh, when it comes to financial support to third parties, in the general information session yesterday, I explained a little bit on you know what financial support to third parties. Is is um, it, in its most common form, uh, it is uh, uh, organizations doing subgranting to smaller organizations or to individuals, but it can have different forms as well. Um, you are allowed to uh, to have financial support to third parties uh, within this uh, this stream of uh, of uh, financing. Uh, these are uh, um, a couple of small additions that I wanted to make, more technical details as to the, the, the funding requirements. And uh, without, uh, without further ado, I would just like to, to move uh, forward to the questions that we received through the registration forms. As you saw on the, on the registration forms, um, uh, you are required to submit uh, uh, questions that you would like answered during the session today, uh, two days in, in advance with your uh, registration. Uh, so um, I would just like to to get us uh, uh, started. Uh, we received a total of, of nine questions. Uh, the first one was asking uh, um, us information on the eligibility under lot one. I believe this was addressed, but if anyone has any doubt, uh, please Please have a look at section 2.1.1 of the guidelines. There you will see the uh, the details of the eligibility. Uh, but uh, you know uh, the, the basic ones: you need to be a civil society organization uh, registered in Ukraine um, uh, that has a not-for-profit status. Again, as I did yesterday, emphasis on look at our definition for civil society because that is quite broad, so it may open up uh, avenues uh, uh, for you that uh, you would like to consider that may be relevant for the implementation of, of the project idea that uh, that, uh, that you may have. Uh, as co-applicants under this lot, uh, local authorities are also uh, eligible. Uh, question number two, does the energy sector fit uh, uh, the scope of lot one? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, that Olga's presentation has already uh, uh, eliminated any doubt whether e energy is also eligible. Uh, energy is, is a very big part of our sustainability agenda, and uh, uh, but definitely for for many reasons we'll be interested in uh, seeing and reviewing applications on uh, various angles of energy governance, um, uh, and energy uh, sustainable tr transition, energy efficiency, uh, or whatever energy angle uh, would be relevant um, uh, in your community or at national level. The optimal percentage of grants cost of the total eligible costs uh, of the action for lot one. Uh, I think that I know where this question is going. Um, uh, however, I will stick to the guidelines. So uh, you will um, have the possibility to request a minimum of 60%, maximum 90% uh, uh, of the total project value as EU contribution. You are required to find a 10% uh, um, uh, co-funding uh, for, for this lot. Um, this co-funding may come in the form uh, of volunteer work to some extent. Uh, please check the guidelines for the for the specific uh, uh, rules. There is no optimal percentage. Um, you can ask for any percentage uh, between 60 and 90 percent, as long as you have a solid justification and as long as uh, what you request matches the financial capacity of your organization to manage this fund, this is what matters for us. Uh, so, you know, do not think that if you will ask for just 60%, uh, you know, this you will be uh, receive a higher score if we if you cannot demonstrate that you can secure 40% co-funding. Yeah. So, in fact, if 
we see any risks that you cannot demonstrate, that you can secure a bigger percentage of co-funding, this may be a disadvantage. So you really need to think, uh, you know, what other partners could, could help you out to implement this project and what is really the, the reality, uh, the financial reality of your organization. This is what matters. This is what uh, we will be um, uh, uh, evaluating. Um, uh, overall information uh, about the preparation of the uh, of the application. Uh, so uh, we had this this general information session uh, yesterday. If you did not uh, attend it, please do so. Um, on Thursday we will have a first training on drafting concept notes. Please attend that one. And then uh, towards um, uh, closer to the deadline, towards mid July, uh, we will have um, uh, at least one other session uh, on concept note training training and addressing uh, some, some final questions that, uh, that you may have. Um, otherwise, all the information that you need for filling in the concept note is in the concept note grant application form uh, itself. So if you open, um, and in fact, I will try to, to do something here. Um, maybe it's just easier if I do this. Um, as I manage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, this is the this is the concept note application form. So you see here uh, the uh, okay from the beginning. This is what you need to fill in the description of the action, uh, the relevance of the action. Uh, two important points here. We will we usually receive a very high number of concept notes. Please stick to the maximum five pages. Um, it is uh, really a, a very strict requirement. Uh, then the relevance of your action is a very important point. Uh, we will um, uh, keep actually the scores for the relevance of your action in the scores that you will receive at the full application stage. Therefore, this, this really matters. So it's not, the concept note is not just a pass and fail when it comes to relevance of the proposal. It's something that, that sticks through the rest of the, of the evaluation. And then as of page eight, you have the instructions for drafting a concept note. So basically these are the instructions as to what do we need to see as a minimum in uh in the the concept note and really all the necessary and sufficient information uh, uh is there um uh, and you you don't really uh need to do you know much more than than follow the the instructions um uh there uh okay mm -hmm. question number six how to strengthen the influence of public organizations in protecting environmental rights um well uh, my uh, the easiest answer would be that uh, we would like to hear also from you uh, how uh, how exactly you can strengthen your position in uh, in promoting environmental governance i don't know olga if you have anything to 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 add on uh, on this uh, topic um i think that you know if you look at the types of actions um in in the guidelines of the cof proposals you will see a, a number of ways in which we uh, think that uh, we will be able to support you strengthen this position um, through monitoring, advocacy, campaigning, piloting, uh, um, I don't know, I mean, uh, um, democratizing, you know, the type of science that has to do with sustainability and transition to a sustainable way of life. Um, Olga, would you like to add something or? Uh, you know, the role of civil society in all those questions is is really very high because uh, um, actually these are uh, these are simple Ukrainian residents who uh, who live uh, in um, uh, who live in the cities in municipalities and see what is happening uh, around them and they can easily assess uh, what what is uh, what is going on. The role of the of the leaders of the civil society organization is actually yes to collect uh, to collect those uh, those opinions to kind of give them a format to give them um, a power and be able to um, how to say to 
um, to make to share all these opinions with the with the local um, with the local government, for instance, right? With the with the municipality, so that would be and to make to make it sound. So that's uh, I think for for the environmental issues for the issues in on on climate change and um, urban greening on the transport. Actually, these are these are the citizens who are benefiting from from all these areas, and actually, those these are also the people who feel the actually the real needs, and so they I think their opinion would be quite uh, quite easy to to collect. It will be important to to gather it, to monitor all those uh, of what is happening, and to make it yeah to take it to the to the local governance first of all, and this, of course establish. Um, a very solid partnership between uh, between the civil society and uh, and the municipalities. So that would be that would be my advice. Okay, thanks a lot, Olga. Uh, next next question: uh, Ecological treatment in school is currently uh, not mandatory. Can we, as a public organization, unite with the state and the EU to jointly implement environmental education in Ukrainian uh, uh, schools? So, um, uh, regardless of you know ecological education, I think that there is there is a principal question for anyone who may have this uh, you know this question: uh, Can we propose a certain project in a certain area? related to this um, yes you may so it, it doesn't uh, uh, the list uh, the types of actions that you see there um, that we we put in the guidelines is is not exhaustive um, so uh, you may propose uh, other types of actions however you need to justify that they link with the priorities and objectives of uh, of the call uh, as to you know can you jointly work with the eu here uh, there is an element as well that uh, that you need to to to, to bear in mind um, uh, it may be a, a little bit of a legal technical issue but it has a political implication as well so you know can we work jointly with the eu we will we would finance your project but you are still responsible for developing this project identifying the problem and carrying it out based on the tools that you um, uh, described in your application form so you know um, we uh, would like to believe that we are building a community of, of EU grantees and that we do support our grantees in other ways um, uh, however you should not be relying on the EU to push uh, uh, cer certain issues uh, you need to propose in your application what you think it's realistic and feasible uh, to do uh, and you know in relation to this specific question um, uh, of course, you know the partnerships that uh, that you will establish uh, are 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 very important. Um, Olga, do you want to add something? Okay. Uh, for a start, we'd like to get general information. For instance, conditions specific demands. Uh, okay. So we are doing these information sessions. We are already starting to receive, uh, you know, clarification questions um, in the functional mailbox that is indicated in the guidelines, but the guidelines are the Bible for this call. Uh, general information, the conditions, size of grants, uh, what you would be uh, evaluated against, everything is in the application package. Uh, if you don't understand something, if you don't, uh, if it doesn't resonate with you, um, uh, please ask us. Um, uh, we have enough time until the 14th of August to uh, address all, all your concerns. Um, what are the main points that should be highlighted in the co concept? Uh, a little bit of, uh, of a repetition here. We, we went together through the, through the, the application form. You have the instructions there. If you have not drafted a concept note for a new applic uh, application um, uh, before, uh, just follow the instructions there. Um, uh, you will see in the session that we were running yesterday that I strongly, strongly, actually in the, in the Q&A, uh, I strongly recommended that whenever you start developing your project, you start with the log frame. Um, that's because uh, 
if you just start filling in the concept note, you may discover midway that actually what you thought is a problem, once you start looking at the statistics, once you start looking at reports, speaking to partners, may turn that is not really the problem you're trying to address. So you may find yourself uh, two days before the deadline trying to mitigate uh, 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 various, uh, um, trying to mitigate various aspects of your concept notes to make it look coherent. And I can assure you that this is something that uh, comes out very clearly um, uh, for someone who does uh, an evaluation, so for us who who would be reading the the concept notes. Um, okay, so uh, th those were all the only questions that that we received. Um, um, uh, I would just like to to remind you, as I said uh, yesterday and uh, even earlier, um, we try to be as comprehensive as possible with the types of actions that are allowed um, that we would be willing to to finance. But again as long um, uh, as um, you can justify that whatever content of the action, whatever project you propose contributes towards the objectives uh, and it fits into the general you know, scope, uh, so for example, nature-based uh, projects uh, or projects looking at biodiversity uh, or, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this, this is definitely something that, that we, we would be looking at uh, at least. So your application would not be rejected uh, based on this. Uh, what will be evaluated is how strong is your justification uh, for the relevance for the priorities of, of this call, uh, which is why we're doing these information sessions to make sure that everyone is on the same page with what we mean by the priorities in a certain um, uh, lot. Uh, when it comes to eligibility of costs, uh, again, uh, there is a certain list um, uh, of costs that are excluded, um, uh, but except those costs, whatever costs would be incurred by, by and through the application through the implementation of the action that you propose are eligible so uh, this uh, would include also um, it, it is exceptional but it would include also uh, works uh, supplies uh, acquiring equipment and so on and again uh, you may want to rewatch the Q&A from from yesterday because there were a number of, of general questions that were answered um, uh, uh, there uh, again um, under uh, this uh, this a lot and actually for the whole call uh, projects need to be a minimum of 24 months and a maximum of 36 months uh, on that note, um, uh, even two minutes early, I would like to, to thank uh, Olga very much and the UProstir uh, uh, team uh, who helped to organize, uh, set this up. Um, and thank you all for participating. I hope that uh, this was uh, interesting for you and that uh, we will be uh, receiving your application. Uh, do not forget to register and attend the, um, uh, the concept note training on Thursday. I think that, you know, looking through the questions we received, uh, this uh, may be um, uh, very uh, revealing and interesting for you. Um, and uh, I wish you all a very nice uh, rest of the week. Thank you, Olga. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, Susanna. Bye. Bye.